Hello again. Um, thank you for staying with us. I hope you will stick around till the end. I'm happy to see that there are uh, discussions going on, questions, very active discussions. Thank, thank you very much for that. But uh, uh, please let me remind you that uh, we will have uh, breakout rooms. We will have breakout rooms in the end. So um, if you need to ask addi additional questions or um, you need to um, you, you need some further explanations from our guest speakers, then please feel free to join in the end the breakout rooms. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for staying with us again. Uh, so I will reintroduce myself. My name is Esa Karaliu. Um, I am co-chairing the Zoonotic Vector-Borne Pathogen Session together with uh, my colleague, Mary uh, Fania. So now I am delighted to invite our uh, first speaker, um, Muhammad Omar Aziz. Uh, Muhammad Omar Aziz is currently a PhD student at the Department of Infectious Diseases and Public Health of the City University of Hong Kong. He completed his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine uh, from the University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Lahore, Pakistan. So Omar, I hand it over to you. Please uh, unmute yourself and start sharing your slides. Let me stop sharing first. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Isa, for your brief introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, so the, today, the topic which I'm going to present is basically a review uh, on canine ehrlichiosis and neglected vector-borne zoonotic disease in South and East Asia. Uh, so briefly, uh, we will discuss about its brief introduction, background, some epidemiology related to its risk factors, some prevalence percentages, um, and then we'll talk about some clinical pathology and clinical signs. Uh, some uh, diagnostic techniques, and, and at the end, we will discuss about treatment and control. Uh, so if we talk about the leukiosis, uh, basically it's a gram-negative bacteria, which is a cocobacilli, and it is an obligate intracellular uh, pleomorphic bacteria. That means uh, it cannot uh, live outside the cell. So the main uh, preliminary cells, uh, the predilection site for its uh, infection is the monocytes, leukocytes, and granulocytes. So here you can see the uh, typical monocyte, uh, and there it is uh, the marula formation of ehrlichiosis. Marula is basically a cluster, a vacuole cluster of pathogen inside the cell. So it is very helpful when we doing a diagnosis microscopically. Uh, so we'll talk about its uh, Ehrlichia species. Uh, there are so many species, but mainly uh, there are three main species, Ehrlichia canis, Ehrlichia evangii, and Ehrlichia chiffensis. Uh, so Ehrlichia canis is mostly found in dogs for causing canine Ehrlichiosis. Uh, Ehrlichia evangii is also a zoonotic pathogen, but uh, mainly for human monocytic Ehrlichia, Ehrlichia chiffensis is the main responsible pathogen. Uh, so it's of more of a zoonotic one. Uh, so if we talk about its brief life cycle, uh, you can see uh, it's a vector-borne disease and it cannot transmit it directly to the dogs and humans. Uh, so for that, it needs uh, ticks uh, for its uh, transfer. Uh, so uh, there are five main vector species uh, for its transfer, namely Ambyloma americanum, Haemophysalis longicornis, Trifycephalus singinus, Haemophysalis yeni, and Derma center variabilis. Uh, but in Southeast, in East Asia, mainly these two vectors, Trifycephalus singinus and Haemophysalis longicornis, are the main vector responsible for its transmission. Uh, so there is a transstadial transmission. Um, it means uh, when a uh, tick bite a uh, dog having an active infection of Ehrlichia, uh, it can, and then if, if it start eggs laying eggs, if this infected tick can transfer uh, it to the larval stage, to the lymph stage, all that. So all the other population uh, coming next will be affected, infected with 
this early key pathogen and then it will uh, that ultimately cause infection to the dogs or humans in case of early case of uh, So we conducted a prevalence study. Uh, till today, there are, uh, if we talk about South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh are the four countries uh, in which uh, Lekia has been reported. And uh, among different Lekia species, Lekia canis is the most important one and the most prevalent one, you can say. So in India, there are uh, many studies and the prevalence ranges from 1.6 to 87%. In Pakistan, there are two studies and they have reported 24.5 and 28% prevalence of Ehrlichiosis in Nepal. There are also two studies and the uh, prevalence ranges from 27 and 8%. So overall, there are 18% prevalence in four different countries of South Asia. Uh, so uh, till now, if we talk about the prevalence uh, uh, about in East, East Asian countries and territories, so we have found the studies in China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan uh, territory and Hong Kong special uh, administrative region. Uh, so, uh, and here is also the Lichia canis is the main uh, pathogen responsible uh, for causing disease, but in Korea, uh, early cash fences was most prevalent. Uh, so in China, there are so many studies and the prevalence range is from zero to 28%. In Japan, the range is very quite high from zero to 100%. So in special territory of Taiwan, there is also from one to 11%. So overall, there is 7% uh, prevalence in these six territories and regions. So if we summarize everything, uh, I summarize it in a map. And if we talk about the vectors responsible for its transmission, and if we talk, uh, in, we focus on South Asia, Rifficephalus singulus, which is a brown dog pig, is the main responsible vector uh, for its disease transmission in South Asian countries. Uh, and, but if we talk about East Asian countries, in, uh, except China, uh, in South Korea, in Japan, uh, in Republic of Taiwan, China, Taiwan, Chinese Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong, in these territories and three countries, uh, we found Haemophysalis longicornis as the main vector trans uh, responsible for its disease transmission. Uh, yeah, so if we talk about its clinical signs and clinical pathology, uh, I took these pictures. It's an actual case uh, which has been shared, which is being shared on, with the consent of the owner and the uh, clinic. It was reported five months ago uh, from a private clinic uh, in Hong Kong, uh, where a poodle came to the clinic with the signs of anemia, bleeding disorder, epistaxis, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia and they conducted a snapshot test and here you can see it is Ehrlichia canis positive. So it's negative for Lyme disease, heart water and anaplasma. So then they perform uh, the CBC analysis. Here you can see there is very low, uh, there is anemia, low RBCs level, and there is also low platelet count. So because it's disease, mostly affect the platelet count, so there is, uh, means bleeding disorders, so epistaxis is the main reason for that. That will eventually cause the anemia. Other signs are atypical, so that's why you can't uh, differentiate this disease just on the basis of clinical signs. Uh, so I uh, thank Kelly, uh, which is a uh, undergrad student of CU uh, from CTU who has provided this data to me. Uh, so if we talk about its uh, diagnosis, mainly there are three methods for its diagnosis, microscopically uh, on the basis of morula, which I have already discussed in the first slide. Uh, so if we use thin smear of whole blood, there is a, around four to 6% detection rate. And if we use Buffy coat, uh, the detection rate becomes 50% because in Buffy coat, there is only white blood cells. And this pathogen mostly affect only the white cells, uh, mainly the monocytes and Leukocytes. So here there are more chances to see the morula. So on the basis of serology, there are two main tests, uh, indirect fluorescent assay and ELISA, uh, but these are non-specific tests, although it's, they are cheaper and faster, but they are non-specific. And they cannot tell the exact uh, timing of the disease means active infection going on because 
they can see the antibodies which can be produced maybe five or 10 years ago, maybe four years ago. Uh, so the more accurate and the most precise method of this diagnosis is PCR and so polymerase chain reaction it's just more active. It, uh, it's uh, for there are two genes uh, which are tar being targeted for its for P30 outer membrane gene and 16 uh, S ribosomal RNA gene for PCR amplification of nucleosis. Uh, so if we talk about its treatment, because it's an obligate intracellular pathogen, so we have to the therapy should be uh, prolonged for at least four weeks. Uh, otherwise, it we can't completely uh, eradicate it. Uh, so um, among the, all the antibiotics, doxycycline uh, is the most important and uh, the most uh, uh, effective one. So with the dose of 10 mg per kg orally, we have to give it for four weeks. And if we talk about its control, uh, the same dose, uh, the same doxycycline in endemic areas can be given uh, with the dose rate of five mg per kg orally as a prophylactic dose. Uh, so, and for the other thing is to control the disease, the vector control for that, we can use some uh, pesticidal sprays uh, like mosquito also to control the mosquito and the tick vector population. So al although it's not very environmental friendly, but in endemic areas, we have to use that. So if we, recent, if we talk about the recent developments of penile neurolytosis in Hong Kong, Recently, in 2019, our veterinary diagnostic lab of CTU uh, have shared this data. Uh, of, and here they sh can show that you can see the Arlichia canis is the second most prevalent tick borne pathogen here in Hong Kong. But there is no uh, comprehensive study yet being done. Uh, so it's 11% prevalent. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I think uh, uh, I'm running out of time. So thank you. I will thank you for the, my whole group, Boylan, Zishan, Issa, and Mariam for their sports, for their sport, and they helped me a lot in presenting this and preparing this presentation. So you can contact me on this email if you want. So uh, if you have, anyone has any question, uh, you can feel to ask. Thank you so much.